Hey guys, and welcome to Anchor to Truth. Today we are diving into chapter 19 in the book of Jubilees. So let's get started. In verse one, and it says, and in the first year of the first week in the 42nd or the 42nd Jubilee, Abraham returned and dwelt opposite Hebron, that is Kirthja Arba, two weeks of years. And in the first year of the third week of this Jubilee, the days of the life of Sarah were accomplished and she died in Hebron. And Abraham went to mourn over her and bury her, and we tried him to see if his spirit were patient and if and he were not indignant in the words of, of his mouth. And he was found patient in this and was not disturbed. For in patience of spirit he, he conversed with the children of Heth to the intent that they should give him a place in which to bury his dead. And Yahuwah gave him grace before all who saw him, and he, and he besought in, in gentleness the sons of Heth, and they give him the land of the double cave over against Mamre, that is Hebron, for 400 pieces of silver. And they besought him, saying, We shall give it to thee for nothing, for he would not take it from their hands for nothing. For he gave, for he gave the price of the place, the money in full, and he bowed down before them twice, and after this he buried his dead in the double cave. Okay, so right off the bat, guys, we've got this uh, this location up here in verse 1, Hebron, that is Karath Arba. I'm probably, probably not saying that correctly. Um, so I have Karath Arba uh, is the same as Hebron, and we've mentioned that before. This will give you just a little bit of a visual on where that is located in the area. And then the second thing I wanted to mention is um, I wanted to get you guys thought on this is the, down in verse two, it says the days of the life of Sarah were accomplished. Now in scripture, we have many accounts of people dying, right? Or going the way of their fathers or whatever. It's, it's worded many different ways, but it's not often that we hear this type of phrasing where it says the days of, uh, the days of the life were accomplished. So what do you guys think about that? So, yeah, I think there's a couple of different angles that we can look at this. One of them being the fact that uh, she had given birth to Isaac, and that was a promise that was given to both her and Abraham. Um, it could be that um, also just a nice way to say that, you know what, her life just came to an end. Um, and that everything that that, she, uh, that was set out in her life to do that she had done and uh, maybe even a third one that I like to throw out there to you guys was uh, this is in the past when we've done our studies, it was brought up that possibly the death of Sarah happened because of what took place with Abraham and Isaac, because that being as their only son, that she knew what was about to take place. You know, it wasn't a secret. Abraham wasn't like, hey, don't tell your mama this, but I'm going to take you up to the mountain to sacrifice. Well, he didn't even know he was going up there to be sacrificed. But there's been speculation that she possibly knew what was what was going on and that it troubled her so greatly that it actually caused her to uh, pass away from it. Hmm. What you guys think? Yeah, no, a point of context for me, you know, as I got going back, as I've enjoy, I've been enjoying bouncing Jubilees up with, you know, our, our Bible, our canon of 66. And in Genesis 23, verse 1, it says, Sarah lived 127 years. So mm -hmm. now we kind of know a little bit of how old she was. And it says that um, these were the years of her life, and Sarah died at... Kiriath Arba, or that is Hebron in the land of Canaan. So very interesting that the story is a very, very similar, almost verbatim. Um, and I and I, and I always appreciate that fact that you know we do have that second witness here. But yeah, for to say that she her days were accomplished, you know, it very easily could have been just the um, author's uh, rendition of she died. But it also mm -hmm. could be that yes, she had a very specific purpose and a, and a reason to be on this earth. You know, we don't. None of us live a life for no reason. None of us have, right. you know, extended days so we can uh, do nothing with them. You know, the Father it has expectations, He has goals and things for us to, to accomplish. And if we didn't have anything to accomplish, we would get saved, as you would call it, and then just mm -hmm. be done. Right? That's the end of the mission. Mission over. Mm -hmm. Time to go home. Right? Time to die. Whatever the whatever the next step is. But, you know, once we walk our path of salvation, he has things for us to do and things for us to accomplish. And right. so here it just sounds like, you know, if this is the case, then she did what she was supposed to. She did all the things that she was called to do here on this earth. And maybe it truly was to have her kid raise him up. And that was the end of her life. You know, that was as long as she was supposed to live. She already lived a good, nice old age anyway. 
but it was not she was not going to die until she completed her mission until she accomplished everything that was said before her mm-hmm. yeah i like that and uh you know it's it, if you if you attend enough funerals um you know you'll hear every once in a while you hear you'll hear it said that this person had an accomplished life and i think it's lost a lot of its meaning in today's world right mm-hmm. we think just because somebody has seen a lot of things, done a lot of things, had a lot of experiences, that sort of thing that they've had an accomplished life or that they were successful in business or they, you know, whatever, whatever the thing may be, they climbed Mount Everest or whatever, that they somehow have had an accomplished life. And, um, yeah, I think this, uh, I, this I do think my personal opinion, I do think that this probably does lend to the, the idea that there was an accomplishment in her life, that it wasn't, mm-hmm. for, it wasn't for naught. Mm-hmm. The, the, her, her purpose for being was fulfilled her end and the father's well you know and you brought up funerals i mean how many times have we heard of someone uh you'll say well how old were they and they go oh they were 89 years old and your first thought was well they lived a full life or you know you use the word accomplished too or you say oh they lived a full life right um so i think it's and i agree with that i think that the the way the author is writing this um or the way it's being penned here is like you know what she accomplished what the father set out for her to do and i think that's as simple as i don't think there has to be any deeper meaning i don't think there has to be you know digging any any more into that i think it's like you lived an accomplished life mm, right. you know we the one thing we all want to hear from from our master one day is well done good and faithful servant amen and so that's that's the that's the life I want to accomplish. <laughs> is when I see him, I want him to I want him to know who I am, and I, I definitely don't ever want to say, "Be from me." I never knew you. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think it's as simple as that. I mean, there's they're not getting you know it's, it's through the sages of old and the rabbis of yesteryears. They're the ones that came up with the idea that possibly that Sarah grieved so hard knowing what what was possibly going to happen to her son that it may have killed her. And maybe it did, maybe it didn't, but it's, it's mostly speculation. But I think one thing we can say for sure is that what the father's will was was uh, set out for both of them, it was done. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, even at 127 years old, maybe that was young for their day. Because yeah, Abraham lives on to be 175. Um, but again, uh, she accomplished for what the father set her out to do. And hallelujah, you know, to that. So I got one more thing. I want to bring up because this pops in my head when I read this. But just were accomplished. For some reason that stands out in my mind. It reminds me of Yeshua on the cross when he says, it is finished. And I know that I've heard it said before that that could also mean accomplished. So let's see what we can find on that. Yeah, Kyle, as you were saying about it being accomplished or finished, I think one of the things about Yeshua being on the cross that we can definitely look back to and something that was accomplished or finished comes comes directly out of our old testament out of the bible in isaiah and it comes out of isaiah 53 verses 5 through 6. all right and it says but he was wounded for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace and with his stripes we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. And if we're talking about something that was accomplished there on the cross, if we're talking about something that was prophesied, something that all the people of the time would have known and read and understood. You know, mm-hmm. we even hear about Yeshua being in the synagogue, rolling open the scroll and reading out of Isaiah. This was not unfamiliar territory for them. They would have seen and watched that play out and they would have known that's the guy. So I think that was something that easily we could point to as being finished or accomplished. Amen. Yeah, and just jumping in there, guys, real quick with this as well. The the word that uh, Yeshua spoke when he was dying on the cross uh, in the Greek is tetelestai. And uh, it says in here, it, it simply just means it is finished. Uh, simple answer, it says it means it is finished. Uh, then they will ask, what's finished? What's the last word spoken by Yeshua on the cross? He said, it is finished. All of our sins have been paid in full is uh, one translation. Another one says in here, it says the word to stelestai is the perfect verb tense in Greek. That's significant because the perfect tense speaks of an action which has been completed in the past, but whose results continue into the present. Uh. 
that was pretty cool. And the last one, I'll bring up in a, in a mil. It says here in a military term that we're to tell to tell us die. Uh, it means the battle has been fully won. Mm. So when Jesus said it is finished, he meant three things. Your debt of sin is fully paid. And finally, on this word, uh, to tell us die, uh, it says come from comes from the verb teleo, which means to bring to an end, to complete, and to accomplish. It is a crucial word because it signifies the successful end to a particular course of action. And that's those three things you were talking about. So that's awesome. Wow. So pretty cool. Yeah. So it brings on a whole a whole new meaning to having an accomplished life, huh? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's awesome. Okay. What else do we have, gentlemen? Well, I like to kind of go into who who is this is trying Abraham here. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we, I think we were, we're talking about these angels, right? Yeah. <laughs> the angels of presence. Yes. So, so far it's been that them the whole time. Right. So and, and what's funny here is it doesn't say the Lord told us to do this. It's like, and we tried him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're doing, doing his will. Yeah, I know. It's like, <laughs> uh, did you learn from the other angels who messed up? Come on, guys. <laughs> Well, I think what's funny is when we read it, like, as if, like, in our modern vernacular and the way that we would interpret it, it's like, oh, we tried him, you know, we put him to the test. But really, it just kind of goes to, it says, to see if his spirit was patient and he was not going to be indignant, if he wasn't going to be a big, you know, sorrowful mess, if he was going to understand, you know, that life is fleeting and then the body returns to the dirt, the spirit returns to the, the father, you know, it's like, how is he going to reply and respond to all this stuff? So, you know, that trying period, is, it's, I think it's more of an interpersonal thing with Abraham, not so much that they were in there poking at him and trying to see if they can get a, a rise out of him. But it's just interesting the way it was worded, especially in the way we'd probably read that, you know, in today's today's English. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says, and he was found patient. Um, man, and he was found patient in this and not disturbed. Man, all it takes for for most of us is just getting cut off in traffic, you know? <laughs> when we think about patience, we think about waiting on something. But um, that's not always how we see impatience play out in our lives. Is We're mm -hmm. not always necessarily waiting for something. Something's just not um, going the way that we want it, right? So I think another way for this expression of patience is... It's almost it's almost like I see patience. Having patience is a submission of will. Submitting mm -hmm. your will to the fathers. Hmm. Well, I now, see patience as the people waiting in the uh, lobby at the doctor. But I also <laughs> understand what you're saying. <laughs> no. So one of the things I wanted to bring up, you know, I was almost going to cut you off because what you're saying was so good, but then I couldn't do it. Couldn't bring myself <laughs> to doing it. So. You, there was a thing that we posed in the last video, and I, I think we might have almost forgotten. I hope you guys online didn't forget. So we were talking about how Abraham was walking through the fruit of the Spirit and how they were happening one by one, little by little. And we said that he went to Sukkot with peace. He left with peace. So we have love, joy, peace. What's the next one? Patience. Patience. Go figure. That's what these angels are looking at. That's what these angels are inspecting, his fruit. And now they're on the fourth fruit. So now we have this challenge again. You guys got to follow along with us, see if number five is going to show up, because this is really cool and really awesome that we saw mm -hmm. it within the first couple of verses. Right. And so going back to the New Testament, uh, when this is pinned, it makes you wonder now where this can't, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like you, you see that with Paul writing this, that Paul would have probably understood all of this here, seen this in here, and went, you know what? Our patriarch Abraham, he displayed these things, was mm. considered a friend of God, and therefore the fruit of the Spirit was with him all the way through this. So it's like, I, yeah, that's a pretty cool connection there. Yeah, and that does make a lot of sense because we we don't have any reference to the fruit of the Spirit before Paul's writing about it that I know of. No, mm -hmm. like direct, like there's a nine right. reference somewhere else. You know, right. we know about the seven spirits of God. We know about a lot of things that can be referenced back to the menorah or something in the temple. But we don't really have a nine reference or a specific, hey, go back and find the guy with all the fruit. You know, it's this specific right. character in the specific time. It's just there. So, Joe, that's a great point that we can actually, so far, we've been able to pinpoint maybe a 
beginning person. You know, it may have been accomplished throughout everybody else, but to see it played out in one person so far has been really cool. Yeah. This is one of those things, man, that when I, when I, when we see, when we see stuff like this, man, it just, it gets me in my getter. You know, it's one of those things that reminds me of. <laughs> Where's that located? <laughs> right here. You know? I think I ate one of them before. Get her. Uh... It, it reminds me of the, the scripture that tells us it's the glory of Elohim to conceal a matter and the honor of kings to search them out. Yeah. Amen. And uh, man, I love it. I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. Absolutely. You know, how many times in our lives, and I, cause reading through here, um, I thought about, I was like, you know what? It's like, how many times in our lives have we been tested by our Heavenly Father to see if we line up with these things? Mm. And now looking back, I I'm like, I think a lot of times we get tested to see, because that's the only way, look, the only way what's going to be revealed inside of you is it's got, it's got to come out. Mm -hmm. And so it's under pressure. It's under testing. It's, you know, this man's wife just died and we know he loved her. Mm -hmm. And so, but if you're reading this along with us for the first time and you think, and you're just, and you, and you haven't pre-read this and you're thinking, Oh, they're, they're testing him over her death. That's not necessarily what it is. As we read through here and we get through the rest of this uh, up to verse nine here, just a little bit, you're going to see where I believe that the true testing of this was. And so, but I, I do believe that um, when we see this, it, it's an amazing thing to see this patriarch who's under duress, who's who's mourning for his wife. And when we, again, when we read the rest of this and you see what's going on, I could literally place myself in this situation. I could literally say, how would, how would Joe Christmas handle this if I was under the same situation? Mm -hmm. You know, just like, um, you know, right now, some of the trials I'm going through, they're not major trials. We, we're in a new home. So this background behind me isn't fake. This is actually my kitchen <laughs> <laughs> that's behind me, but it looks just like a, a, a backdrop. Um, but, you know, through the process, if you've ever bought something new and you went through the process, Jonathan, I know y'all's home when you bought it. You went through a process of when you walked in, you already had a toilet that was leaking on the floor, messing up the floors. You already had this and that, you know, for me, uh, it's a little things. I just had my HVAC installed yesterday and not that it's hot out, but the HVAC wasn't working and I knew it wasn't working because it never shut off throughout the entire night and my home never cooled down. And so I wonder if these are things that God puts in my life because when the two fellows showed back up today to see what was wrong and then one guy looked at me, he's a young guy and he goes, uh, Mr. Christmas is my fault. I forgot to turn these two valves on. And therefore, there was no Freon running through your system at all. And he was overly apologetic to me and was probably expecting me to yell at him as a homeowner. And I can't believe you did this and blah, blah, blah. But you know what? I shook his hand and I said, I said, man, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. I said, everything's good. And the other guy, and I said, I said, I, I, I tried to let those things get to me. And, and the other guy that's with him was a young guy. He looked at me and goes, man, he goes, I don't know how you do that. He goes, I wish I could do that. And I got to, you know, share with them just briefly a little bit, but it's just, you know, what they're, what the world's expectation is sometimes, and we can bring God and bring a better expectation. Oh my gosh. That just speaks volumes to people. Why we're, and this isn't the only thing that's happened at my house. These guys know I've literally had water coming in my new house twice. <laughs> and, uh, that's something you don't want to see is water coming in down your brand new sheetrock into your laundry room. And, but you know what? I was like, these are things that are going to happen. And I believe that through that process of me being overly kind to those who are involved in it, I've actually gotten favor from them. And when I call for the littlest things, they're very quick to jump right on and take care of it for me. And, but um, that's just something in my life I've seen over and over here the last couple of years is that we have the ability to change someone's day, even if, What's happening is, you know, it was happening to me, but I have the ability to make that young man not feel like lower than dirt that that happened. I said, and, and then he came up to me and shook my hand again. I said, look, I said, if, if, you're, if your boss goes to yell at you, just tell him the homeowner is not mad at all. <laughs> I'm not upset. It happens. I'm glad you guys came out and fixed it. God bless you and be safe on the road. And that was it. How many times do we have that opportunity in our lives where, Yes, we're being wrong, but how, how many times do we have the opportunity to share God 
to, to show patience, to show loving kindness, to show the fruit of the spirit, and them go like, I can't believe he's being so nice right now. I'm used to being yelled at. <laughs> right. And just speaking that uh, to me, that speaks volumes into someone's life personally. I have to bring up one more, one more scripture. I have to, man. I have to. This is um when I start when I going down that road of patience, right? One one more thing really, really stood out to me. Now in the ESV that I have pulled up here, it uses a different word. It says endurance, but this is Revelation 14. Uh, verse 12, it says, here is a call for the endurance or patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Mm. So patience is always also uh, represented as endurance. And I think I think what I see there is uh, this patience or this endurance that we're seeing is a consistency in your character your consistency in your heart that you have become different, mm -hmm. almost like a new creation, right? Mm. Um, that you have become something that you weren't before, that you're, that you are patient in, and you're enduring in your ability to, keep God's commandments and obey him in all ways, not just for his sake, but also for the sake of those around us. Like you, like Yeshua said, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I see a, I see consistency in that. Oh man. There's so many trails we can go down on this. This just amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, man, I think what's, I think what's interesting that we're going to see too is that it's more about the spirit that as we're going through this, what you're going to see is that, you know, when we focus more on the spiritual side of it, it's going to change the dynamic of the words we're using. Right. So when we talk about patience, you know, we consider the DMV and that could be called patient. Right. But we're talking about more of the spirit behind it. So when we read in verse four, it says that for impatience of spirit, and I'm going to cheat a little bit, and Kyle doesn't normally let me do this, but right there in verse 8, if we go a little bit there, it says, And he was found faithful, patient in spirit. And so I jumped ahead just a touch, but I wanted to show that connection of it's it's focusing here on his spirit. And it's not just him being patient, like he can sit around for a long time and, and wait. It's mm -hmm. not like you know the definition we think today where it's like, oh, I sat in the line and I didn't cuss anybody out or whatever. It's <laughs> dude, you're you're patient in your spirit. Like it's it, that's what's coming out of you is what's mm -hmm. what the type of person you are is you're a patient person. People know that about you. It's it's something that's emanating from you. And so yeah, if Paul's referencing back to Abraham, then yeah, that's the kind of guy I want to be. That's the kind of challenge that we need to give ourselves is to have be patient of spirit. So I just wanted to kind of make that connection and cheat just a little bit. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you went ahead and pointed that out, man, because that is a big deal. There's a big difference. It's, it's nice that people can refrain and hold back from showing their impatience, but it's completely different when you can tell there's something mm -hmm. truly different about a person on the inside, right? Yeah. It's a, it's, it's, it's something that we can tell, Imagine what the angels can tell. Oh, yeah, man. They're like, Kyle blew it again. Doggone it. <laughs> I mean, hey, we got to give him a little credit. You know, he wanted he wanted to slash some tires, but he didn't, you know. <laughs> okay, well, I'll let you I'll let you slide on the skipping ahead part this time. I appreciate you. <laughs> and uh, let's not forget, let's not forget too, if we hadn't already mentioned it, this is uh Abraham's tenth trial. Mm -hmm. which I still, I, I think this is so interesting that when, uh, you know, later in the story of the children of Israel, when they're coming out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt, they were tried 10 times as well. Unfortunately, where the patriarch passed all 10 times, uh, not so much for the children of Israel. So therefore the uh, backside of the desert for 40 years. Mm. So I wonder if there's some type of pattern. I don't know. I, 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 mm. I think we got to dig into that a little bit more another time. Oh, yeah. I, I think there's too much we can go in on that. Anyway, I tell you what, how about this, guys? If you guys have anything 
that you'd like to any little nuggets that you found along this uh, along these topics, uh, please buy them, put them in the comment section section. Even if it's if you, even if it's only a chicken nugget with some honey mustard, we're cool. There with you it. Go. There you Share go. with everybody. Okay. What else we got? <laughs> well, in here we got the whole the whole point of him talking with the children of heaven. And uh, you know, since our brother Jonathan jumped ahead, I think to go ahead and bring this into full context of what's happening here. We should just go ahead and read uh, seven through uh, nine, or, or, or actually, yeah, go ahead and finish out this small bit of here from seven to nine to get the full context of why I believe that he was being tried here as well. All right. Well, before we do that, um, let me just show this um, because we're going to move past this just to make sure we get it in here. So we had this mention of Mamre here mm -hmm. over against Mamre. So. Uh, and they gave him the land of the double cave over against Mamre. And remember in previous videos, we looked at this tree that they believe to be the Oak of Mamre. And it's, they're trying to support it with all these beams and metal things. Man, and let true. it go, bro. Let, <laughs> that was misery, man. <laughs> they Looks won't like let it die. <laughs> seeing better days. And then uh, the next thing is, this map should give you a little bit of a, uh, a visual. So over here to the right, we have uh, right of the Dead Sea, we have uh, Sodom or Saddam and Gomorrah. And then over here to the left, the two areas where you got Jerusalem right here. And then down at the bottom, this little dot, this is Beersheba. And then up above uh, in the plains of Mamre. So these plains right here would be um, would be Mamre. So just to give you a little visual on where everything's at. All right. I think we can, uh, unless y'all got something else, I think we can move on now. Yeah. Well, I mean, we got the 400 pieces of silver there. I was just doing a little quick search on that. Uh, I'm not sure if it would uh, also translate as shekels or not, but uh, it would be about mm -hmm. roughly 200 ounces of silver. So in today's money, that would roughly be between five and $6,000. Okay. All right. Yeah, I actually got a whole nother answer on that. But, you know, when we're trying to go back and look at ancient monies and their process behind it, and we have to we have to consider a lot more than just the money weight itself. It's what did it take to get that money? How much labor hours did it take to earn that one piece of silver? Because then that would add the intrinsic value behind the actual metal itself. So there's right. a lot of details that go into that. I know a lot of times we try to look for that one-to-one -one translation of cost. And we forget about inflation and the efforts and what it, you know, what it costs. Like, you know, if we look at our paychecks today, it takes us 40 hours to make one week's worth of pay. It's not just, oh, there's $100 equals $100. So it's it's interesting to go back. And I guess, like you guys know by now, I, you know, I enjoy the money side of things. So I've, I've done all the weird and digging and taxes and how the money would have worked back then. And it ends up being way more than we think just because it's not that one-to-one -one value. It's, you know, we can't take a piece of silver from there and just convert it in today's dollars because it's not – uh, equivocable in that same manner, but super cool. fun. And Joe, you were spot on with the actual value, so that's correct as well. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know <laughs> if these uh, if these pieces uh, actually do um, weigh out to that in ounces, um, right? You know, but uh, I don't know if I don't know if you guys ever have ho held an actual gold coin or silver coin either. But uh, there you go. They got some weight to them. How, how many ounces is that, if you don't mind me asking? So this one's one. This one's two. So it's a little bit thicker. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, okay. So if that's a, so that that's a you have a two ounce coin there. Yeah, and a one ounce. And a one ounce. Okay. So so if if that two uh, those coins were or if those pieces of silver, it don't even say coins, but it just says pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. Um. If they were around the two ounce mark, and they could have even been more, we don't know. They could have been right. greater than that. Um, I don't know if we even had an established monetary system at that time, or if they were simply dealing in precious metals. You know, I mean, it could have been chunks as big for all I know. You know, I don't know, but anyway, it could be significantly more expensive than what we're thinking. It could be around the five oh, six thousand yeah. mark. It could be hundreds of thousands of dollars worth well, right and uh you know our brother jonathan there being the finance man so i did look this up as well and we're talking about the labor e equivalency uh standard it says uh basically 
that would come out to the purchase. I won't go through all the math in it, but it says basically the field at 400 shekels then sold for equivalent of, of about today's money in land value on top of that would be about $128,000. Okay. So, yeah. A shekel was not a very thick piece no. of No, no, not at all. So, yeah, I don't think we were talking shekels here. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, did you want to go ahead and uh, did you want to go ahead and read that other part before we continue discussing this? All right, guys, let's go ahead and pick it back up in verse seven. And it says, in all the days of the life of Sarah were 127 years. That is two jubilees and four weeks and one year. These are the days of the years of the life of Sarah. This is the 10th trial wherewith Abraham was tried and he was found faithful, patient in spirit. Just like we talked about earlier. And he said not a single word regarding the rumor in the land how Elohim had said that he would give it to him and to his seed after him. And he begged a place there to bury his dead, for he was found faithful and was recorded on the heavenly tables as the friend of Elohim. Uh, something that jumped off right up front is I think um, I got a definition maybe that I didn't know for sure before. You know, when in the very beginning there in seven, it says that Sarah was 127 years old. That is two jubilees, four weeks, and one year. And I was doing the math in my head while you were talking, Joe. I'm sorry. I wasn't listening as good as I probably should have. But <laughs> if you look at two jubilees, I've, I've just been counting in my head 50 every time that it used the word jubilees. But every time it's using jubilees as a time marker in jubilees, it's 49. Otherwise, this math doesn't work. So it kind of helps me now to you know go back and maybe redefine each time I'm reading a jubilee. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just assuming it's already saying 50 years has passed. But it's in actuality, it's the 49 going into the 50th, because if you do 49 plus 49 plus then it, and the four weeks, which is 28 plus then the other one, then you get to 127. So I just kind of did some quick math. And I thought that was interesting. And, then, you know, so as we read on continuing, continuing, you know, we'll kind of be able to maybe use that math and understand the numbers a little bit better with jubilees are being counted as 49. There Seven you go, weeks. man. Mm -hmm. That's why you're our, our, uh, our math guy. So, so guys, let me ask you this. Are you seeing maybe possibly what I'm seeing here, what, what the trial actually was? Do you see what I see? Well, it depends on what you see. <laughs> what do you see? All right. All right, let me tell you what I see here, okay? <laughs> so what we're seeing here is this, guys. This is, this is my interpretation of what I'm reading here. Abraham has promised this land. God's, we already know that God set him out, and he said, hey, as far as you can see to the east, to the west, you know, frontwards, backwards, it's all yours. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we're first reading this, is when I was first reading this chapter, my first thought was, oh, he was being tried to see, you know, how he's going to handle Sarah's death and all that stuff. But that's really not the that's not the point of this trial. The point of this trial here for him was that God had given him a promise, right? This land will be yours. So when he shows up to the sons of Heth, he could have very easily said, I'm going to take this because mm -hmm. it's mine. So do we see a connection here why Abraham wouldn't even take it as a gift from them? Even though somewhere down the road here, when this is all fulfilled, this is your land. Matter of fact, I'm not even, I'm not going to take it for free. And by the way, I'm going to overpay for it. I'm going to give you 400 for it. By the way, I could have rolled up in here and just said, you know what? I'm, I'm the man and I'm going to just take it and it's going to all going to be mine. But he didn't. The patience part of this was this part of God's promise was not fulfilled yet. So he had to show patience. He had to show kindness. He had when he when he when he's presenting himself before the sons of Heth, mm -hmm. he could have very easily just been a different person here but he didn't. And he was found faithful because he's like, you know what? I'm going to be faithful to what God has said. And I'm going to walk this out though. This land isn't technically mine yet. I know that it will be to my seed. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to not only not take it for free. I'm going to give them more money than what the land is actually worth on top of that, even though it's technically going to be mine. And I'm going to walk this out with, with humility and what we were reading there in, um, in verse 8 there, it says, uh, and, and when Abraham was tried, he was found 
faithful to what God has said. He wasn't arrogant. He was patient in the spirit and knowing that as, as, as the father has spoken, I will trust everything he says and therefore was found to be a friend of Elohim. That's my take on it. I, I, I really like that. So he's not, he's not, he's, he don't have himself in this mindset of, okay, this must be my blessing. These men want to give me this land, this piece of land, this, this, uh, he, he's not accepting that. He's not saying that I'll accept this as my blessing because this is what God has already promised me, even though it's only a portion of what God had promised mm -hmm. him. He's, he's patient in the sense where he's like, no, I'm going to stand on what God said. He said, he's going to give me all oh, of this. That's so right. when he gives it, he's going to give all of this because that's what his literal word said. So in the meantime, I need to handle this, take care of this, uh, and not consider this part of that, not mm -hmm. consider this part of that I'm giving to you because yes. I, I need to deal with this situation right now. Um, and I'll, be patient and wait upon the Lord for his promise. And, and not only that, but this is That's the awesome. same situation also, Kyle, with when um, uh, the, I forgot the name of the king. Was it the king of um, what was the king that offered him all the the, the, the riches and all that stuff? You remember? Uh, are you talking about the king of uh, Sodom or Saddam? That's right. That's the one. So when okay. the king shows up, uh, what does he want to what does he want to give to Abraham? Oh uh, yeah, as it says in I think it's what is it? Yeah, Genesis 14, 21. So it says, And the king of Sodom said to Abram, so he's still Abram back then, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. So that, that's very interesting, you know, that one, we can go back to Abram. So this is before he's even Abraham. He's still following God's plan and doing what he's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Almost you know, preparing for this test he's got going on now. And I pulled up this map just so we can kind of see, you know, Saddam was over, uh, Saddam, Saddam was over here. And then we have, he's all the way over here now. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of a journey. A little bit of a journey. Yep. So the point being that when the king of Saddam shows up and he wants to give him all this stuff, Abraham's like, he's not going to receive anything from the king because none of the promises come from that king. Hmm. Right. All the promises come from Elohim. So again, when he shows up here with the sons of Heth uh, for the burial place for his wife, he's not going to accept anything from them because it's like it's not really theirs to give anyway. It's for the Heavenly Father to give to him. And so on top of him not, you know, receiving it for free, uh, he's going he's gonna to give them more money really than what it's worth. And also that way that there's no bragging rights from anybody else to go look what we gave Abraham. Right. So no, no man ever gets God's glory. That's what I love about Abraham. He's smart enough to know that, oh no, by the way, uh, you're not giving me anything. Everything I receive is going to be from my heavenly father. And that way no man could ever say, well, look what we did for you. Man, just even applying this in today's, uh, today's modern situations, you know, I can't tell you how many times um, I've either seen this done with other people or I've experienced it myself where somebody's like, you know, wanting to give me something that, especially when it's something that I didn't need at the time. Right. Um, it, it was nice. It just wasn't something that, that I couldn't live without. Right. Um, for example, for example, um, pull over on the side of the road and, and help somebody change a tire and mm -hmm. want nothing for it. Right. You know, no, just go and be a blessing for somebody, you know, and you just the whole pay it forward concept. Right. And then, but, but I've been in situations like that where somebody's like, you know, here, let me pay you. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And no, really, you know, don't miss your blessing. And it's almost like they kind of guilt you into taking their money, you know, don't, you know, how do you deal with that? Don't miss your blessing. And I'm like, I don't, I don't really need your 20 bucks. I mean, it's, it's nice, you know, I can get a pack of chips or something and a soda at the gas station. But I mean, that doesn't make me or break me that 20 bucks, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, um, it, it, I don't know. I'm just trying to put this into, into modern concepts when people say, don't miss your blessing. Um, 
I don't know that I really want a blessing from someone. <clears throat> I want a blessing from the Father. Well, and, 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 and the Father the, work through people, sure, but uh, you see, you see where I'm kind of my 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 thoughts are right, on that. Right. Well, I think that the way that we should look at what you're doing, you were actually the blessing to someone else. They didn't need to give you anything in return. Just like right. when we're all in a particular place in our lives where we receive a blessing from something, you know, and we want to get, we're going to give God all the credit for that. Of course. Right. I think the difference is, is when we know that this is something coming from the father and versus we did something to be a blessing to someone else. It's like, no, you don't have to bless me with money. I didn't do this for money. I did this for you. That's mm -hmm. the blessing part of it. <laughs> right. You know right. what I mean? So. Yeah. And to kind of go off of that, I think part of what we maybe sometimes miss, because this is something that, I say God had to work on me with because I'm I'm very much like how you're talking there, Kyle, where it's hard for me to receive anything just period. You know, I want to work for what I have and I want to, you know, what I have is what I have. And that's that's the end of it. But one of the things that I felt was revealed to me through reading of scripture is, you know, it talks about it's better to give than to receive. And what I was doing in those people's lives, unfortunately, especially that person was coming from a right place, like a Christian brother or sister, is I was not allowing them the opportunity to give. And if it's better mm -hmm. to give, it's a principle that they needed to learn. It's a principle that they needed in their life was that they had an issue with giving or it was harder for them and it was a sacrifice. So by me receiving, it actually gave them the, the blessing there was that they're learning that thing that, you know, like you, all three of us here on the camera would give all the money in our wallet away if, if, if we knew there was a need because of that, that's that heart, that spirit behind it. And if we deny somebody that option, that opportunity, that may have been something that God was working on them in that moment. And so I've actually yeah. had more peace about it is, you know, if it is better to give than receive, and it's a blessing to give and to be a cheerful giver, I don't want to let somebody miss out on that opportunity. If it was something that they really worked up to, something they've been practicing and uh, uh, something that they've really been working on and to say, no, 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 it's fine. They're like, well, I know it's fine, but I really want to walk this out. I really want to practice this in reality. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's helped me to be in that scenario where I would never, I would always say no. And then I said, you know what? Sometimes we, it's our job to say yes and let God deal with everything else on the back end. And, you know, to relate that back into the story, you know, we, we can read in Luke 16, 10, it says, one who's faithful in very little is also faithful in much. This, 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 this little land, this little piece of land here, is considered very little right. compared to the all of Israel, especially the original boundaries that God set forth. It's very little. Abraham was found faithful in this very little. And I think that what we're going to see is this little bit that he was faithful in. How many times as you're reading through Genesis and the other stories of the Old Testament, how many times you're going to read about the cave, the double cave and the field and then the, oh, the, the well, mm -hmm. these, these, these stories play out over and over and over. Again. And you know why? Because he owns it now. He has that ownership behind it. Abraham's name's attached to this land forever. It wasn't just some gift. He paid for it. He was faithful in it. He owned the deed. So whenever there's going to be some later contention over this land and over this piece of dirt, he's like, nope. Hey, go back, go back to Abraham. We can read it. He bought it. There's no question marks. We're not going to have any issues and we're not going to fight over it. So I, I kind of look at it from that principle of God was working on him. And so he gave, and as he was given, he was faithful in a little. And then, so, Hey, you know what? You're faithful in a little. I already promised you the lot, but I'm glad that you're faithful in the little and the lot will mm -hmm. come. And so there's, there's a big principle that I've really kind of poured into on that of giving versus receiving and ownership and just really walking the walk that the father has us on. Absolutely. And just, uh, I know this map doesn't show the whole thing, but just to give it a little perspective, you know, this, this tiny little piece right here, this tiny little piece is what he's purchasing when the promise was for way up here above this, you know, <laughs> where the map cuts off and down below where the map cuts off mm -hmm. and over to the east and, you know, to the, to the west and all, you know, all of that, all of that. Mm -hmm. And then some, so yeah, there's uh that was the, the promise. So very cool. Thanks for sharing that guys. I know it, it might've seemed like we got a little off track there, but I think it falls directly in line with understanding what's truly going on here. So mm -hmm. thanks for exploring that with me. Well, before I get off my soapbox, the, the last thing I wanted to say on this point, and I think that this is pointing to his character in this uh, over here on the right side, there is a, a note that's given a scripture reference in Isaiah 41, eight, where it calls Abraham, his friend. 
Abraham, my friend, right? And um, I just think that's so important. And and one of you guys brought it up earlier. I think it was you, Jonathan, about being a friend to God. What an example. And there's so much more that we need to learn from this. And there's so much detail in Jubilees about this that we don't get in Genesis. And I, I think this is absolutely amazing that we can dig into this and learn more about the character of what a friend of God is to look like. Yeah. And then the last thing I got to say about this, guys, that the fact that, again, we see re- written here is it being uh, recorded that he was found faithful mm. and it was recorded on the heavenly tables. And of course, you know, and, and on the heavenly tables is actually written in the heavens as a friend of Elohim. What an amazing life, amazing story. Yeah, so both you guys absolutely nailed it and absolutely killed it there at the end. And I think what we're looking at, like Kyle has off to the right there, that little note where it's talking about Abraham being a friend. It's quoted again in James. If you guys don't know already, James is my favorite book in the Bible. <laughs> I read it often, so much life application. So to see that that's quoted once more, it's showing that it's that important, that it made it from the Old Testament, made it all the way to the New Testament. And it really shows us that's something that we can look at, something that we can point back to and use Abraham as an example for us throughout all of the scripture, right? And Joe, you you bringing up the point of it being written on the heavenly tables. What I find fascinating is we kind of view the heavenly tables as things that have been written and they're just there for forever backwards. It's just telling us about history. It's telling us about things that are already happened. You know, okay, they've been celebrating this forever in the tables, blah, blah, blah. Abraham has now had an impact at a large enough level that it is now written in. It wasn't written before because he was not alive mm-hmm. before. This story had not happened before. So his real life actions and his real life experience of being found faithful and showing patience of the spirit. Those things played out in such a way that he made it into the biblical <laughs> narrative and into the tables written in heaven. So with the challenge is, what are we doing in our lives and how can we, in some small way, in some small impact, find a way to make it into the story, to be a part of our own lives and our own relationship with the Father and even the lives of others around us. So with that, we will see you next time for part two of chapter 19 in the book of Jubilees. God bless. Ciao. Hello.